1990, the Philadelphia Museum of Art hosted a juried exhibition of regional artists. The selected artists had been educated in schools from all over the country, but many had earned art degrees at Philadelphia's giant University of the Arts, known then as Philadelphia College of Art, and Temple University's Tyler School of Art. There was also the tiny, in terms of enrollment, Pennsylvania Academy of the Fine Arts, which offered not an academic degree, but a certificate. Although a bachelor's degree could be obtained by students who wish to take and pay for additional courses at some local universities. The exhibition was divided into a number of categories. Crafts, books, prints, photographs, sculpture, installations, video. But there was also a category called paintings and drawings. 38% of the chosen artists in this category held certificates from the Pennsylvania Academy. And most of them are still leading creative lives today, 34 years later. That is a remarkable record of success, not just in terms of artistic merit, but more importantly, in the profoundly meaningful creative lives that these graduates have lived. This is just as true for those of us who never had breakout careers as it is for the very few who have become stars. How did the Academy pull this off? The school was very focused on traditional forms of art, drawing, painting, printmaking, and sculpture. It did not discourage students who wanted to explore other forms, but it only taught forms that led to handmade works that could be hung on a wall or placed on a pedestal. The school required that we all start with a rigorous education in the basics of art, but after that training, we were expected to use those skills in pursuit of our own individual ideas and ambitions. And very importantly, it was affordable. The yearly tuition I paid in the late 1970s is equivalent to about $6,200 in today's numbers. This meant that after we graduated, we could get by living cheaply, working part-time, and developing our art. Now, clearly, the art world has changed enormously since 1990. In fact, it's become multiple art worlds, with installations and digital and conceptual art competing with painting, printmaking, and sculpture. But should the Academy be teaching these new forms. Some, like digital animation, are so complex and technical that they require a highly specialized level of instruction. Others, like conceptual and installation art, seem fundamentally unteachable. And on a practical level, while you don't have to be famous to sell a really well-made painting or print, Fame may well be required for you to sell your room-sized installation. I joke that if you haven't seen a kind of art on Antiques Roadshow, like an installation or conceptual piece, the Academy in the 1970s didn't teach a class on how to do it. But that certainly does not imply that Academy students are stuck in the 19th century. Perhaps our most famous graduate of the last hundred years is David Lynch. He wasn't taught how to make films at the Academy, but his movies are filled with the lessons of composition and emotional expression that he did learn there. Art schools that try to teach all things to all people are really struggling in this post-COVID world. Costs are way too high, both administratively and more importantly, the cost to attend. I called up Dan Miller to ask him about what made the Academy so effective back when I was a student in the 1970s. 
He said that the Academy wanted to take the best ideas from the Royal Academy of Art in London, which was strict and rigorous, and the Academy of Beaux-Arts in Paris, which was freer and encouraged a more creative spirit. Also, a generous set of prizes and trips to Europe encouraged healthy but vigorous competition among the students. The prizes were awarded at the year-end student exhibition, which for years was called the Crescent Show in honor of the greatest award, the Crescent Traveling Scholarship. And by sticking within its lane of teaching only traditional forms, with a faculty supported by a very small staff, the Academy kept costs low. And Dan added that the faculty were a talented and lively bunch, each committed to their own way of making art. The aesthetic clashes between the teachers were an invaluable part of the educational experience. Students learned to make choices and figure out what had meaning for them. But regardless of the faculty's differing aesthetic viewpoints, they all insisted that students must learn the fundamentals. And students instinctively know that. Back in 2014, I caught up with my friend, abstract painter Harvey Weinreck, at an alumni cast drawing session at the Academy. Harvey is a terrific abstract painter, so I asked them an obvious question. So you were traumatized by cast drawing? No, as soon as I could do it, I said, I don't, I don't want it to. But until I could do it, I wanted, I had to do it, I wanted to do it. But I didn't want to keep doing it. So you learned how to do it good enough to quit doing it? According to my own standards. <laughs> I, don't, I didn't need anyone's permission, so. As for me, trained at the academy, I then showed my paintings for decades. But in 2007, I switched to filmmaking and everything in my movies is informed by what I learned at the Academy. Combining rigor with freedom is a winning formula. Some schools today seem to be all rigor and no freedom, or all freedom and no rigor. In the 1970s, the Pennsylvania Academy, as far as I'm concerned, had achieved a perfect balance. And I am certain that if the Academy can get its finances in order, that the model that served my generation so well back in the 1970s and 80s can serve a new generation in the 2020s. We can look to the Academy with gratitude, not just as an historical presence, but as a place of welcoming convergence, where lives find a confident focus where dedication is fostered and challenges embraced. A working faculty conveys not only the intricacies of process, but search out what each student holds within. Enriched by a vibrant past, the school propels and motivates our futures.